Hey everyone, welcome to Southridge. If this is your first time joining us in this format, we wanna offer a couple of tips on how to make the most of the experience together. First of all, be sure to crank up the volume during the music and be sure to sing along. If you're a musician, download the music charts below the video, grab your instrument and play along. We would love to have you. If English isn't your first language or you experience hearing challenges, we encourage you to turn on the closed captioning in this video. You can also download the transcripts for this morning's message to help you follow along a little bit more easily. And if you haven't done so yet, please be sure to download the Southridge app. This is a great way to stay connected to everything that's going on in Planet Southridge. Uh, it's completely free and it is very easy to use. Now, while we are so glad that you've joined us today online, we want to remind you that every Sunday morning, we gather in person as a church at all three of our Niagara locations. We really believe that this gathering in person is a far superior experience to simply taking in the service online. And we would love for you to join us when you're ready and when you're able. That said, we create this online experience as an accessible option for those of you who can't or aren't ready to join us at this time. Still, we invite you to participate as though you were with us in person. And while it's nice to be able to sit back and watch from the comfort of your own home, we want you to know that God's vision for our lives is not about making us comfortable. And following Jesus isn't something that happens simply by passively observing. Our desire by joining us today is that you feel stretched and challenged, almost like the spiritual equivalent of going to work out at a gym, those sore muscles. What we do is not always easy, but, when, but it is designed to strengthen and transform us more and more into God's image. So if the experience raises tough questions, please ask them. If it surfaces strong feelings, don't be afraid to fully feel them. And if you sense the Spirit of God is speaking to you, lean in and listen. We believe that God wants to meaningfully connect with each of us. So do your very best to give God your full attention and to wholly immerse yourself in these next moments as we approach the God who made us, who loves us deeply with a posture of curiosity, openness, and honesty. Now, as we begin our time together, wherever and whenever you are joining us, whether it's your first time or you've been around forever, we hope that in the next hour, you feel like you are among friends and family. Welcome to Southridge. We're so glad you're here. between us by the cross you came and broke them down you broke them down there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger your love awakens 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 me your love is greater your love is stronger your love awakens 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 me darkness shaking all the dead are coming back to life back to life hear the song awaken all creation singing we're alive cause you're alive you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Yeah, sing what a love, and what a love we found, death can hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive, and what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive, and what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We 
shout it out We're alive cause you're alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me
The biographies of Jesus contained in the Bible describe the events of the evening before Jesus was crucified. That night, after having dinner with his friends, they all went for a walk to a local garden called Gethsemane, where Jesus went off by himself to pray. This was Jesus' way of preparing for all that was about to happen. You see, in just moments, soldiers with torches would arrive to drag him away to be brutally beaten and executed. Jesus, steadying himself for what lay ahead in a moment of raw honesty, prays that he won't have to go through with it after all. The Gospel of Luke records that prayer. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. In this moment, Jesus experiences such anguish that Luke says, his sweat became like drops of blood. It was brutal. Even so, Jesus submits to God's way, rejecting his own instincts and surrendering control of his life into the hands of God. Can you imagine how counterintuitive that attitude is in today's world? A world where follow your heart has devolved into never let anyone else ever tell you what to do, think, or believe. We don't submit to anything or anyone unless we agree with them, which, if you think about it, isn't really submission at all. It's a cultural sin to lay down your rights, surrender your autonomy, or sacrifice your independence. But in Jesus, we hear a voice that cuts against the grain of our self-serving instincts. Not my will, but yours be done. This is the Gethsemane prayer, and it's what we're going to practice right now. I invite you to hold out your dominant hand, palm up, and I'm gonna guide you to think about different areas of life where we're all tempted to want things our way. Maybe even tempted to pray that God would orchestrate things according to our ambitions, hopes, and plans, wanting our will to be done. But instead, we're going to practice praying Jesus' Gethsemane prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. Let's start with our ambitions, the goals and drives that push us forward in life. Who are you aspiring to become, in your own eyes and in the eyes of others? What are you working so hard to achieve and accomplish? What, at the end of the day, does success look like to you? Imagine you had it all, right in the palm of your hand. Now, to the degree that these ambitions are not fully realized, I invite you to consider them through the lens of Jesus' Gethsemane prayer. What would it look like to let these ambitions go and pray, not my will, but yours be done? If you're willing to go the way of Jesus, I invite you to turn your hand upside down as if you're letting it all go and silently pray those words not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my strength, but yours alone. Nothing else. You, oh Lord, I find everything in you. Now, as you turn your hand back to the palm up position, consider the relational hopes and longings you have. Where are you tempted to want to control the people around you? It could be a close friend, a co-worker, a love interest, maybe your spouse or your sibling, a child or a parent.
frankly, it could even be someone you dislike, any enemy or competitor. If there's someone who represents a constant source of disappointment or discouragement, imagine that you're holding tightly to that relationship, that person, in your hand right now. Now, imagine yourself there in the garden with Jesus, kneeling in the dark, praying to be let off the hook. And in this moment, turn your hand over and release whatever and whoever you're holding on to. Letting go of your desire to control them or to have that relationship go as you would hope. As you do this, silently pray to God, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my strength, but yours alone. Nothing else but you. I find everything in you Finally, turn your hand palm up one more time and consider your plans for the future. Imagine finally achieving financial security, accomplishing all of your career aspirations and reaching your retirement goals. Maybe it's a dream home, a full bank account, extended vacations or other lifestyle fantasies. What are the big ticket items on the list of your life's accomplishments? Imagine for a moment that they all came true. Now, what would it take to turn that hand over and let them go and join Jesus in praying, not my will, but yours be done? If you're willing, do that now. Not my will, but yours are done. Not my strength, but yours alone. Nothing else but you, O oh Lord. I find everything in you. Surrender, I surrender, I surrender all to you. I surrender, I surrender, I surrender all to you.
diverse community of imperfect people who see the church as less of something to go to and more as a life to be lived and shared with others. We are continue going and what it means to love one another. Fighting for unity rather than fighting over unnecessary arguments. We are living to serve this world in the way of Jesus. Serving those in need and those on the margins. Knowing that friendship truly makes a difference. So if you're coming with questions or curiosities, hurts or frustrations, joys or celebrations, wondering if the church can bring clarity or hope, or simply be a place to belong, we invite you to be at home with us. We invite you to explore with us. We invite you to grow with us. And we invite you to belong with us. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Hey there, my name is Jessica Reimer and I serve as the Director of Connection here at Southridge. We're so glad you're participating with us this week and we hope that this has already been a meaningful experience for you. I'm standing here in our St. Catharines location and if you've never joined us for one of our in-person gatherings at one of our physical Southridge locations, we invite you and would love to have you consider joining us in person when you feel ready and able. While we're so grateful to have this online platform to share in the experience from wherever and whenever we find ourselves, we love it even more when we can be together in person and embrace the magic of community. So please know that you're welcome to join us on any Sunday in person, and we will strive to quickly help you know that you belong. Especially if you've ever felt excluded or ignored by the church, we'd love the chance to change your experience and let you know that you are loved, accepted, and welcomed with us. In fact, if you happen to live in the St. Catharines area, I'd love to personally invite you to our location and would be thrilled to have the chance to meet you if you do decide to join us. And if you live near the Vineland or Welland location areas, I know you'll find the same welcome at those locations too. Now for any of you who are brand new to all of this and may be participating with us in this online service for your very first time ever, we definitely want to say a special welcome to you. It's good to meet you, so to speak, even through the screen. And we're so glad that you've chosen to check us out. We hope you feel like you're among friends and family, even in this format. As our way of saying thanks for joining us for your first time, we'd love to give you a gift of our Southridge Jam from our social enterprise, the Southridge Jam Company. If you click on the new here or gift button below and share your contact info, we'll be in touch and safely deliver a jar of our Southridge Jam to you this week. Similarly, if you're looking for a way to get in touch with us, meet with a pastor, ask any questions, get baptized, or learn how to get more involved in our community, please take a moment to fill out the Connect card on our website or app, and we'll be in touch with you this week. For those of us who call this community home, one of the ways we can practice togetherness and express our gratitude to God and generosity to others is through our regular financial contributions. This is one of the ways we can invest our lives in what God is doing in and through our church community, making a difference by meeting needs among us, across our region, and around the world. 
All of our online giving options are available on our website. And so if you're able to give this week, we invite you to do so in a spirit of joy and generosity. And we thank you in advance for your faithfulness. Now we want to transition into this week's talk. And as we prepare to hear it together, we invite you to remove as many distractions as possible and listen in to what God might want to be saying uniquely to you. We're so glad you've joined us and we look forward to growing together. I think one of the most disconcerting things about the idea of living under law, like Canadian law, is this idea that ignorance is no excuse. You've heard people say that, right? Just because you didn't know something was against the law doesn't mean that you're not guilty of breaking that law. If you break it, you can't just walk around saying, well, I didn't know that I wasn't allowed to murder my neighbor. That's just not ignorance is no excuse. And I think what makes that really disconcerting as a principle of law is that there are a lot of laws that we don't know exist and probably are guilty of breaking. Um, did you know, for example, that in Petrolia, Ontario, it is illegal to whistle in public against the law? Now, I know people from Petrolia, and I think they're whistlers. And I don't think they know that they're breaking the law. <laughs> Canada has some weird laws about painting. Did, in Alberta, it's illegal to paint a wooden ladder. In Ottawa, it is illegal to paint your house purple. And in Baconsfield, Quebec, you can be sued for painting your house more than two colors. Did you know? In Oshawa, it's illegal to climb a tree on municipal property. My kids would be in jail right now. <laughs> in Ottawa, this, is a, this one I love. In Ottawa, it is illegal to eat ice cream on Bank Street on Sunday. And Monday, Tuesday, enjoy your ice cream. On Sunday, get that crap out of here. That is not allowed. <laughs> in Uxbridge, Ontario, this is the last one that I read about. In Uxbridge, Ontario, it is actually illegal to have a Wi-Fi connection that is faster than 56 kilobytes per second. So all you five subscribers in Uxbridge, lawbreakers, <laughs> right? We don't even know these laws exist, and that's no excuse. Just because you didn't know that stuff was illegal doesn't mean you're not guilty of it. And a lot of us are saying, well, I've never been to Uxbridge and paid for Wi-Fi. Yeah, well, you know what? I've lived in Ottawa, and I've been on Bank Street, lived about a 10-minute walk from Bank Street, and probably had ice cream, and it might have been on a Sunday. And I didn't even realize that I was a lawbreaker. And all of that makes me think about the second of the Ten Commandments, the one that we're going to look at today. It says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever, of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. When you worship God, do not make an idol, a statue, a form, a representation, a picture, an icon, anything to represent God in your worship. Now, I think... On the one hand, a lot of us are like, whew, okay, nine commandments that I need to worry about. I've literally never done this one, except maybe we all do in ways that we don't realize. What is this commandment about? Because I'll tell you, it's not about whether or not you have a statue or use art in worship or use your imagination. That has nothing to do with what the commandment is about. This commandment builds on the first commandment, which is about the who of worship, right? Last week, we talked about how God said, I am alone worthy of your devotion and love. I don't want you to love anything more than me, as much as me, instead of me, in competition as me. I want you to love me alone. That's the who of worship. This commandment is about the how of worship. How do we express our worship and love to God and what the commandment says is, you do not resort to idolatry. You cannot make an image. Why? 
Well, I'll explain it in terms of the ancient world, and then I'll help us understand why this still matters to us. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, thinking back to this command, the writer of Deuteronomy says, You saw no form of any kind the day the Lord, that's God's name, the day Yahweh spoke to you at Sinai out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape. The writer of Deuteronomy, thinking about this commandment, says, listen, it's pretty straightforward. When God revealed God's self to Israel in the desert at Mount Sinai to reveal the Ten Commandments, God did not show them a form. What did they see when God revealed God's self? In Exodus 19, it tells us, this is the chapter just before the Ten Commandments. It says, Mount Sinai was all in smoke because Yahweh had come down on it with lightning. The smoke went up like the smoke of a hot furnace. While the whole mountain shook violently, the blasts of the horn grew louder and louder and Moses would speak and God would answer Moses with thunder. When Israel came to Mount Sinai to meet with God and enter into a covenant relationship with God, and God showed God's self to Israel, he didn't, God didn't show himself to have a form. He, God descended on the mountain, and it was covered with thunder and lightning and smoke and fire, and it trembled like an earthquake, and God spoke out of the thunder, but there was nothing to see. And the writer of Deuteronomy says, since there was nothing to see, don't make a form. And here's why. Because in the ancient world, all worship was done with idols. Essentially, if you wanted to worship a god or needed to worship a god, you would go and either make for yourself or get a statue made and have it blessed by a priest so that the statue contained the life force of the god within it. And then you got to take it home. This was your little mini version of God. You got to carry it with you. You could own it and possess it and carry it wherever you went and have it in your home and put it on the shelf. And when you needed it, you took it off the shelf. And and it was your way to access the life and power of the God, which was important because if you needed your crops to produce food or you needed your wife to produce children, you would get your fertility God off the shelf And you would offer sacrifices and pray for the God to give you what you wanted from your field or your spouse or whatever. You had to offer the right sacrifice in the right way at the right time using the right priest and the the right phase of the moon and the right season and pray with the right words in the right way and all that. And if you did everything exactly pleasing to the God, then the God would give you the life that you wanted. This is the point of idolatry. Idolatry in the ancient world was about reducing God to a form that you could manage in order to use it to advance your own agenda. Or as uh, Patrick Miller says, to make an image is indeed an effort to domesticate God, to tame the fire and control it. Idolatry happens any time we try to reduce God to a form that we can understand and manage in order to control and manipulate for our own purposes. It's when we use God for our purposes. God says that is not okay. Here's the end of that commandment. It says, do not bow down to idols or worship them. This is Exodus 20 verse 5. Because I, Yahweh, am your God. Um, I'm a passionate or zealous or jealous God. I punish children for their parents' sins, even to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But I am loyal and gracious to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, let's not misunderstand what God is saying. God is not saying, I'm an emotionally petty God. I'm a very small God. And if you don't love me, love me, love me, I'm going to be jealous, you know, in a real petty way. No, no, no. It's like a... Two spouses who have left the altar and promised their love to each other, they are rightfully entitled to be jealous for the exclusive love of their spouse. God says, I'm just jealous for your love for myself. God is not saying I'm a petty 
vindictive God. You know, if you don't do everything the way I want, then I'm going to throw a temper tantrum and I'm going to just punish you all or whatever. It's like God is acknowledging that when we choose to go a way that's different than God's way, that those choices to sin have consequences. God is not being violent and saying, you know, I, I'm going to I'm going to lash out violently, not just at you, uh, but at your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids and third and fourth generation or whatever. No, no. Three or four generations are how many people live in a home together at the same time in an ancient household. God is saying, when you choose to sin and and worship me in a way that's different than what I want, um, not only will you experience the consequence, but everyone around you will experience those consequences, too. What God is saying is, I want you to worship me in the right way because I am jealous for your love and I am zealous to see you thrive and flourish and experience life. And I am passionate to bless you and not just you and your kids and your grandkids, but a thousand generations of those who love me. I just want to give you life. But in order to experience it, we have to resist the temptation to reduce God to a form that we can manage so that we can control and manipulate God to serve our agenda. That's what idolatry is. What does that look like in the church? Well, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is writing to a group of churches in modern-day Turkey, and he talks about idolatry. This is what he says, For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person Such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. The the Apostle Paul says, you know who the idolaters are in, you know, the church age? Idolaters are people who just want what they want sexually or who don't care about sinful immorality or who are just greedy and gluttonous and covetous and so on. Um, Those people worship idols because Paul says, here's the problem. He says, this is why he says, don't let anyone deceive you with empty words. He says, the problem is that in the church, what we often do is we want what we want sexually, or we, want, we don't want to obey, we want to sin, or we want to be greedy and gluttonous and covetous and whatever. We want to live the way we want to live. And so what we do is we find a way to biblically justify living however I want to live, and yet still we get to think about this as being faithful to follow Jesus. We kind of get to have our cake and eat it too. We we get to believe that God is okay with us just pursuing our own agenda. What does it look like? I'll I'll give you half a dozen examples. I think in North America in the 21st century, the health and wealth gospel, the prosperity gospel is an idol. This belief that honestly... All of us share to some degree that God only wants us to be healthy and wealthy all the time. That's why we get mad when everything doesn't work out for us, when our privilege is violated. But we just, we reduce God to this God who only wants to bless us with good things as a way of justifying our comfortable lifestyle. Give you another one. We talked about it last week. I think happiness is an idol in the church. The number of times I've had people sit in my office over the last 24 years and say, well, I know that God doesn't want me to be unhappy. Therefore, dot, dot, dot. And usually the therefore is, therefore, I'm leaving my spouse. Now, that is not a commentary on all divorce, not by a long shot. It's a commentary on the ways that we reduce God to a supernatural being who wants us to be happy to justify the way we just pursue our own happiness. We've turned God into an idol. I think violence is an idol. Even in the church, we've we've allowed ourselves to be convinced that Jesus is a fighter, not a lover. That when we ask, what would Jesus do in response to somebody who gets in Jesus' way? And the answer is Jesus would knock them on their behind. But I listened to a preacher say once that they couldn't worship the hippie Jesus because they couldn't worship a Jesus they can beat up. Where is Jesus' ability to beat people up? Anywhere in the Gospels. But we use that, we reduce Jesus to that kind of idol because we want to justify our violent verbal and physical outbursts towards people who get in our way. 
I think judgment is an idol. We've just become convinced that God looks down on and judges the very same people we look down on and judge, whether they're of a different race or whether they're of a different socioeconomic class or LGBTQ plus people. Whatever. Oh, look at that. God disapproves of the same people I disapprove of. We've reduced God to justify our agenda. I think politics is an idol in the church. If you're convinced that God fully endorses your political party and ideology and that God fully opposes the other political parties and ideologies, then you have reduced God to a political idol in order to justify your own political instincts. Honestly, finally, I actually think religion itself, theology can be an idol. If, if your conviction is that God agrees with every one of your spiritual opinions and God disagrees with everybody who disagrees with you, you have reduced God to an idol in order to justify your belief system so that you don't have to actually stop and ask whether there are ways that your beliefs need to change. Friends, we do it all the time. We worship God as an idol where we take the mystery of who God is and we reduce God to some form that we can possess and manage and control so that we can manipulate and use God to advance our own agenda. And God says, none of it. What God wants is to be worshipped for who God is, not reduced to an idol. What does that mean? To worship God for who God is. Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy 4. Remember I said, you didn't see a form, don't make a form. Well, the verse just before that says this. Yahweh spoke to you out of the very fire itself. You heard the sound of words, but you didn't see any form. There was only a voice. God says, I don't want to be known by what I showed you or how I appeared. I want to be known by what you heard me say. I want to be known by my voice. I want to be known. I am revealed by my word. What is it? How does God reveal God's self in his word? John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh in Jesus of Nazareth and made his home among us. Jesus Christ is God's voice to the world. Jesus Christ is what God has said to humanity. Jesus Christ is what God says to show us what God is like. No wonder in the New Testament, God says over and over again, Jesus is my son whom I love. Listen to him. In the New Testament, it says that Jesus is the exact representation of what God is like. So if we're going to worship God truly, according to what God is genuinely like and not reduce God to a form that we can use to advance our own agenda, we're going to worship the God who is revealed in Jesus Christ. We're going to conform all of our thinking and believing and behaving and attitudes and actions and convictions to what we see and hear in Jesus Christ. We're going to submit all of our lives to walking in the way of Jesus until our lives look exactly like what we read about in the Gospels. Until our lives radiate the devoted love of God for the world, the radical love of inclusion and welcome and forgiveness and healing and hope and justice for the world, the radical love of God that we see in Jesus that pushes back against judgment and religiosity and injustice and exclusion. We will live what we see in Jesus, in Jesus' radical cross-shaped, sacrificial love, which opens the floodgates for the love of God to flood the world. Jesus laying down his power and privilege in order to lift people up into connection with God. We will live what we see in Jesus, which is somebody who always only ever set aside their own agenda in order to submit to the will of God in the world. Who never chose sin, but who always chose love. 
Friends, every time we take God and reduce God to an idea or a form, every time we try and capture the mystery and jam it into a tiny box that we can own and possess and carry around so that we can tame and control and use for our own agenda, we are breaking the second commandment. We're committing idolatry. And God says, I'm passionate for your love and I'm zealous to see you thrive in your humanity and I long Um, to bless you and to fill you with life. And the pathway to life is for us to worship the God we see in Jesus Christ and to allow and align our lives to be conformed to everything we see in Christ. That's the only way to worship a God that cannot be reduced to an idol. Let's pray. God, we confess that it is hard to let you be you uh, because then we can't be in control. Then maybe you're going to make us uncomfortable. Maybe you're going to say things that we don't like to hear or maybe you're going to call us to do things that are beyond or outside of our comfort zone, God. Um, And yet, When we look at the person of Jesus, when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus says he alone is the way to experience genuine and abundant life. God, would you teach us to worship you in the beauty of who Jesus is? And would you teach us to give you everything that we are to live a Jesus-shaped life by the power of your Holy Spirit? And it's to your end that we pray. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated to Thee. Take my moments and my Holy
We are a community of imperfect people who desire to put into practice the good news that we preach. Our faith is not about an hour of watching or attending. It's about a lifestyle of full devotion to Christ. Not just a something to believe in, but someone to follow. We don't want to talk a good game on Sunday only to remain unaffected or ineffective for the rest of the week. So while we gather each week to sing, pray, listen, and learn, we know that an hour a week will never produce the life change that we so desperately need. It requires a daily investment of time and training. It takes practice. And practice. And more practice. And when we mess up, we forgive ourselves and each other. Then help each other up and keep practicing. As we go now, into the rest of our week. May we not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. May the Spirit of God fill us to make us kind and compassionate, honest and humble, generous and hospitable, those who repay evil with good, respond to injustice with action, overcoming despair with hope. Let us be known, not by what we're against, but by what and who we are for. And most of all, let us love one another because God is love. It's been good to be together, but now it's time for us to go. In the name of the Father who loves us unconditionally. In the name of the Son who restores our true humanity. And in the name of the Spirit who empowers us to live life to the full. Amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining us today. We hope that you have felt inspired and challenged by our time together. And we know that for what we've heard today to become reality in our daily lives, it's going to take way more than just a one hour a week that we spend together. It requires a moment by moment, seven day week commitment to practicing the way of peace and the way of Jesus. That's why we provide a host of ways to continue to lean into God's presence while we're away from one another. As always, you can click the Practice This Week button below the player for daily spiritual exercises to continue to develop the muscles that we've started to build today. And if it helps, you can also opt into the Spiritual Practices notification on our app to get these helpful reminders every morning as you start your day. As our time together ends, we're going to put some questions up on the screen. If you're watching with others, they can serve as a great conversation starter, but they can also be a great way to process and personalize what you've heard today on your own. And if you'd like a more personal conversation with someone about everything that's going on in your life, we invite you to reach out to one of our location pastors who will follow up with you privately. Simply go to southwestchurch.ca slash contact. That's it for us this morning. Thanks so much for joining us and have a great week.